um, after the division into the northern ten tribes which was called Israel and the southern two tribes which was Judea and there was a succession of kings in Judea and also in Israel after Solomon most of the ones in Israel were evil they did evil things but at this particular time there were two kingdoms of the Jewish people and at times they were at war with each other um, this title is three kings the text is about three of the kings of Judea the first one this is all this is all in second chronicles uh, starting in chapter 28 the first king we're talking about here is King Ahaz and in 2 Chronicles 28, starting with verse number 1, it says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. Now, when it talks about the kings of Israel, it's talking about the northern kingdom. And that kingdom was born in rebellion. Most of their kings did evil before the Lord. And when it says, unlike David, his father, David wasn't directly his father, but it means David, his ancestor. He was descended from King David. Many of the Judean kings, the Judas kings, were evil as well. And it says in verse 3 that he burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben Hinnom and sacrificed his children in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Child sacrifice was a main method of worship of the cow-headed god named Baal and also uh, Molech and Chemosh, the other gods of people around them. They offered their living infant children to be burned alive as a sacrifice to Baal. Some of these kings even led the way in murdering babies. Verse 4, he offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. The spreading trees, sometimes called groves, sometimes poles, were shrines of Asherah, where the people worshipped by doing perverted sexual acts. Verse 5, Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. The Arameans defeated him and took many of his people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel who inflicted heavy casualties on him. The king of Israel at this particular time was one of the lineage of the northern kingdoms and they were at war with each other that was the first king in this three king three king series that we're looking at today the next one is in second chronicles 29 and this one is king hezekiah Hezekiah was 25 year old, years old when he became king. Now observe that this that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, the evil king. Okay, that was his son. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. David wasn't, of course, directly his father, but he was descended from him. His father was Ahaz, the evil king. Verse 3, in the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the door 
doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. <clears throat> he brought in the priests and Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side and said, Listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. He's talking about his own father and some of the others. <clears throat> they did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror as, and scorn, as you can see, with your own eyes. What a difference between these two kings. And it was father and son. One evil, following his own inclinations, and the other was a good king right from the start. Whether his life was good from the start, we only know him from when he was 25 years old. Obviously, that would be when Ahaz, his father, died and he was, became the king. Then if we go to 2 Chronicles 30 and go to, uh, go to chapter uh, uh, chapter 30 and verse 6 at the king's command couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials which read people of Israel return to the Lord the God of Abraham Isaac and Israel <clears throat> that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your parents and your fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them an object of horror. As you see, verse 8, do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Stiff-necked. <laughs> I don't think that's like you can fix that by going to the chiropractor. I get stiff-necked and I go to the chiropractor. That's not this was talking about. This means stubborn, unable to change, unable to see things in a different way, in a, in a, in a new or better way. We can't be stubborn and be in submission both at the same time. We can't follow our own ideals and attitudes and be in submission to God at the same time. We can't be so convinced that our way is God's way, that God can't change our heart about something. Continuing in verse 8, he said, Come to, this sanct to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God, so that his face, so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Then if you go to chapter 31, it says, When all this had ended, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh. After they had destroyed all of them, and those were the places where the infant sacrifices and all the perversion had been taken place. After they destroyed all of them, the Israelites returned to their own towns and to their own property. What a change had gone on here because one man, because Hezekiah was determined to follow the directives of God instead of his father and what the people were doing at the time. And then if you go to chapter 32, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. But then down to verse 7, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, 
But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. So after all the cleansing and returning to God, Sennacherib of Assyria came with a vast army, but Hezekiah had faith and believed that God would help them to fight this battle and that they would not be conquered. So then in chapter 32 and verse 21, and the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. And so he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. Victory in the challenges of life come when what we're doing honors God. And then things change a little bit in chapter 32, verse 25 and 6. But Hezekiah's heart was proud and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem because he got proud. The Lord sent an, an angel to destroy that army, but Hezekiah got into pride. Pride is a sin. His heart was proud. He did not respond to the kindness. And then verse 26, then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. So he was a repenter, just as, but even though he was a good king, there was still something that he needed to repent of. That's the way it is with us. Even though we're Christian believers, there are things that we need to repent of from time to time. And I hope I'm not the only one that's like that. I don't think so. So even the people of God can be prideful. And we do need to repent of being prideful. Believers need to constantly monitor their attitudes because maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to change your attitude. So the next king then was Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old. This is in 2 Chronicles 33. When he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. And it says here in verse 30, in verse 2, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. This is Hezekiah's son. Ahaz's grandson. He's doing like his grandfather instead of like his father. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah pools. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Verse 7, he took the image he had made and put it in God's temple, of which God had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. You know, Manasseh is thought of as the worst, the most evil of all those kings of Judea. 
and what he was doing I mean he took the good the goodness that, that happened in the land and turned it upside down just turn it upside down and, and he was completely evil and here's what happened verse 10 the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people but they paid no attention so the Lord brought against them an army, the army, uh, commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. Here's the key in, in verse 12. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. Here's a man who had murdered his own children, who had led Israel or led Judea in all this idolatry and wicked, wicked and evil things. So here he is in a foreign land, probably waiting to be publicly executed with a hook in his nose. But he's seeking the favor of the very God that he had rejected and turned his back on. And verse 13, and when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Manasseh didn't pray to Baal to whom he had sacrificed his own children. He didn't pray to the starry hosts or to Asherah. He knew in his heart that they couldn't help him. He prayed to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He prayed to the God of his own father, Hezekiah. God touched him. He repented and God allowed him to go back to Jerusalem and to the end to, to resume his kingdom in second chronicles 33 15 to 16 this is what he did when he got back there he got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the lord as well as all the altars he had built on the temple hill and in jerusalem and threw them out of the city then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thanks offerings on it and told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. So what a contrast here. Ahaz was bad from the beginning and stayed bad. He stayed that way. He never yielded to God. Hezekiah was in a yielded life from the beginning, or at least from age 25 that we know about. Manasseh had to come to a yielded life. Notice that Ahaz started out bad and stayed bad. Hezekiah started out good and st stayed good except for the, for the prideful attitude he had for a moment. Manasseh is our lesson. He started out bad, but became good. We are like Manasseh in a way. Everyone is, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous, not one. Manasseh had even sacrificed his own children. In the fire, he was about as evil as he could be. He was thought of as one of the most evil kings of Judea. There isn't really a little evil. Evil is evil. Sin is sin. And all of us, all of it will separate us from God. Sin is separating. Separate is separate. There's no little sin and big sin. Sin is sin. If I'm in sin, I'm not with God. Separate is separate. You can't make, be made more separate or less separate. You're either with God or you're not. You, you can't hover around in the middle. You're with him or you're not with him. Manasseh had a drastic turnaround. I mean, this was one of the most drastic. To talk about Paul's drastic turnaround, this was drastic. 
In his distress, he sought the Lord. The Lord was moved by his entreaty and brought him back. So the change in his heart, in a word, was humility. Then he tried to undo all the evil he had done. He did his best to get rid of all the nasty stuff he had done. Couldn't bring his children back, but he could prevent anybody else from sacrificing their children. He restored proper worship. So it takes yielding to be and to do what God wants us to do. It takes a yielded life. The first yielding is the yielding to the Holy Spirit at salvation. We quit going our own way, the way of the world, and accept Jesus as God's Son, accept that He came to earth, accept that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, accept that He was resurrected, and accept that He waits for us in heaven and He's preparing a place for us there. It takes a yielding to accept that. Paul had to yield on the road to Damascus. Noah had to yield and start building. You want me to build a what? A what? It had never rained before. You want me to do what? Moses had to yield at the burning bush. Abraham had to yield. Get out of this country that you know. Get away from the people you know. And go to a different country that I will show you. He didn't know the culture, didn't know the language, didn't know anything. But he went, yielded. But the first yielding at salvation is only the beginning. We're talking about living a yielded life, not just one-time yielding. God approves of our yielding. We must submit our ways to His will. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, verse 6, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. You see, Manasseh was wise in his own eyes at first, and things didn't go well. He had to humble himself. Things didn't go well even for, don't go well even for believers when we try to figure things out all by ourselves without the influence of God. And we do that. I hope I'm not the only one that's ever done that. I don't know why we do that. But I think most of us do that from time to time, lean on to our own understanding, figure it out ourselves. Manasseh had a godly father. Hezekiah was one of the best kings of Judea. If Hezekiah had fathered in, had fathered in his father's footsteps, he would have been one of the bad kings. Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, was an evil king. He even sacrificed his own children in a fire. And when they did that, they burned the children alive, by the way. Hezekiah escaped that. His father sacrificed his children. Hezekiah was one of the children. He escaped that. So Manasseh took after his grandfather, Ahaz. Was that why he was evil? No. He was evil all by himself. Ahab, Ahaz was evil all by himself. And he was the son, and the son of Manasseh, Manasseh's son, now in, in chapter 33, verse 21, Ammon, Ammon was his name, he was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. 
Abraham and worshipped and offered sacrifices to all the idols Manasseh had made. But unlike his father Manasseh, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Ammon increased his guilt. He was bad all by himself, not because of his father, because his father had repented. I was bad all by myself, not because of something somebody else was doing. I was away from God because, me, because of me. It was my guilt that caused Jesus to go to the cross. Guilt increases when we don't humble ourselves. The kings that were evil were evil by themselves. I was evil by myself. Until the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and convicted me, I didn't want to hear anything about God. And I certainly didn't want any of God's rules to be my standard of behavior. I rejected all that. I wanted to do things my own way. I wanted to live by my own standards. Came to those thoughts when I was probably a teenager, early 20s. But I had to yield. I had to humble myself. But that's only the beginning. Yielding is a continuing process. We run into situations that are unsettling or even threatening. When we try to solve problems based on our own knowledge and the wisdom that we think we have. <laughs> or based on our own sensibilities, we push God out of the decision-making process. It's not evil. We will do better if we stay in God's will, not our own will. Amen. So how do we do that, stay in God's will? Well, number one is stay in the Word. God's will is revealed to us through His Word. Psalm 119, 105, a very familiar verse. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. It directs our going and coming and moving about his word. And it's all of his word, but you don't know it if you don't stay in it. I have a hard time remembering most everything, but I keep reading it. And there's fresh things in there every day for me to follow. Second one is pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where it says pray continually in the King James, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that every second of every day you have to have a prayer coming out of your heart. That means not to cease in the habit of having a prayer life. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that you can never stop. It means to be in a habit of always going to God. And, and you know, anytime there's an idle moment, your thoughts go to God in prayer. Number three, listen for the still small voice. This is a good one. In 2 Kings 19, 11 to 13, the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. In the King James came a still, small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? God had asked him that more than one time on his way. He was running away from Jezebel, who had, after he killed the 400, and the 400 prophets of Baal. The still, small voice, the impression you get when God's speaking to you. 
You know, we tell people, well, God told me thus and such, and they think we're hearing things and they were crazy. But it's the impression you get in your spirit. That's the still, small voice. It's the impression. And if you listen for it in your prayer life, you know, if you have a conversation with somebody, and after you have said your piece, you walk away from them and they can't speak to you or answer you. Well, don't do that to God. It's not polite for one thing. And you don't give him a chance to answer. So that still small voice is really a guiding thing for you. The fourth one is to be willing to exchange your attitude for God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Proverbs chapter 8 is the great wisdom chapter of the book of Proverbs. And it starts out this way. It says, does not wisdom call out, cry out in the King James? Does not understanding raise her voice? There's three places at the highest point along the way where the paths meet. And uh, in verse 3, beside the gate leading into the city at the entrance, she cries aloud. Have you ever been in a traffic jam and you wonder what's going on way down the road you can't tell? And you wish you could climb up on a tree or something and see how far away that is? Well, a high point along the way, the way is a path of life, the road. At that high point, the wisdom of God calls out because God knows what's ahead of you. Where the paths meet, that's intersections of life. That's where you come to the cross and decide you're going to go God's way or your own way or the world's way. And there are many intersections in life where you have to decide what you're going to do. Where the paths meet. Wisdom, it says she takes her stand. That's wisdom. This is talking about God's wisdom here. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries out. The city is where there are people. So this is referring to any time you were entering an entanglement with people. It's talking about a job. It's talking about where you might want to go to college. Because maybe that's, maybe that's a woke, ungodly college. It's talking about... Marriage is talking about your friends, where the the gates leading into the city, entanglements with people or groups of people. It can even be a church. Should I go to this church? There are people there. And Proverbs eight seventeen says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. If it, it, it comes to us then to seek God's wisdom. His wisdom is vastly superior to ours. And it's available to us just for the seeking. So we have to stay in the word. It's life to your soul. Stay in prayer. It's your connection to God. Listen to the spirit. That's how we get direction, sometimes for new things or sometimes to stay away from certain things. And it's talking and it's talking about being willing to submit to the Lord in all things. Amen. That's that's what you call living a yielded life. It isn't, it isn't momentary yielding. It's life yielding. It's living the yielded life. It's living that way all the time. Well, we're going to gather here and have communion. So come on down.